we're continuing Philippians today, and uh, it's a lot of fun. I like Philippians a lot. Um, yeah, let's dive in. Sometimes we, the church, uh, throw out the word mashup Christ-like, which, if you can believe it, isn't used all that much outside of the church. It defines itself pretty well. The aim is to be like Christ, to have a heart for others like he did and does, to love sacrificially, to do what is right whenever the choice comes our way. I remember when WWJD bracelets were everywhere, at least everywhere when I was on a Wednesday night church program as a second grader. Anybody else remember WWJD bracelets? Yeah, yeah. Anybody still have one or wearing one currently? Oh, bummer. Now what do you guys, if, not, if you're not doing what would Jesus do, what are you guys up to now? Um, no, uh, yeah, what would Jesus do? WWJD stands for what would Jesus do? And the bracelet was supposed to help and remind the wearer to make choices like Jesus. Sometimes you might have just worn the bracelet because it was cool and, uh, I don't know, Christianity was maybe a little bit different. It was the only maybe, like as a guy, the only bracelet you were allowed to wear or something like that. Um, but you could feel like part of the group just by wearing it. Others took it more seriously to actually try and help them, to have it help them think, really, what would Jesus do um, in any number of the variety of life circumstances. But really, what would Jesus do? Uh, this chapter in Philippians, chapter 2, really gives us a view of what being Christ-like looks like. By looking at the attitude of Christ himself, we get to see what would Jesus do. We have both law and gospel, how we should be unified and why we can be unified in an attitude like Christ's. Check it out from God's word. Philippians 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Philippian church, incredibly loved by Paul. They're doing a great job of supporting each other, supporting the delivery of the gospel through Paul. Um, as Jay's talked about the past couple weeks, he's stuck in jail. His opening of his letter is just like, Man, I wish I was with you guys instead of, you know, in jail. He encourages them to, to stick together, be united to, by Christ, to follow Jesus with humility. Um, and I'm going to quick bump us back to Philippians 1.27, uh, which is my old confirmation verse, uh, to lead into, into Philippians 2 a little bit. Philippians 1.27 says, So let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ." So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Remember, this is Paul writing to a church. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And that conflict he's talking about is, you know, the threat of being jailed while still wanting to preach Jesus. Paul's desire for this church has remained unified through all the hard stuff. External attacks, the suffering that they're already going through for the sake of the gospel. The church of Philippi is taking hits to follow Christ, just like Paul was. They've been granted belief in Christ, but also suffering for Christ. 
Paul's advice is to stick together and support one another. Be united in Christ. He gives all we need. Stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I think of that like lay Miz, like arms linked with each other. That's a, that's a, a team, it's a line of people marching in the same direction. That's, that's what I think. Stand firm, one spirit, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And that's the best way to make it through the attacks coming from the outside. And sometimes, at, at least for me, um, it feels a little bit easier, the attacks on the, the outside, the suffering that we go through, if you know that other people are suffering as well. I mean, it sounds bad. to be like, well, suffering is, my suffering's bad, but if you're also suffering, then I feel better about myself. Um, and you might feel bad about feeling better about that. But it's, it is helpful, especially if they're suffering for the same reason that you guys are. Uh, have you ever had like a, a really long shift and it's been like, like at your job and you and like the same coworkers throughout the whole thing and you know, you know like it's a bad day but they're all having the bad day with you and so it makes it a little bit, a little bit better? Uh, or have you ever like been encouraged by your team to, to keep going even when it's hard? That was, that was cross country for me. Cross country is full of some of the most encouraging people I've ever met because nobody loves just running three miles for like the sake of it. Espe- like, and you can, there's two different ways. Like you can run three miles like, oh, that was nice and I'm breathing at the end. But the point of cross country is to run three miles to like right at the end at the 3.1 that like you can't breathe normally anymore and you put your all in there. And the people on the sides are encouraging you hey, keep going until you can't, right at the end. Um, I remember Coach Chris, like, I sprinted really fast at the end of a race one time, and I felt really good about it. I, like, passed some guys, and he was like, you realize you could have just used that energy, like, the whole race and probably passed more people. And I was like, come on, Coach Chris, like, you see how fast I was? I was passing people? And no, but, you know, but there's, there's so much encouragement, um, and, it's, and it is suffering. Cross country, man, is just all mental games. Here's my one other story about cross country real quick. I remember like warm, warming up running and you're running around and you're like, oh, I have to race today because races, they just hurt and you don't want to do them. And like looking around, I was like, if I stepped in that hole, I could roll my ankle and I wouldn't have to run today. <laughs> if I like fell over right over here, like anything, it was like, oh, to not, to not race. But when you have your friends, your teammates next to you, um, going through that suffering becomes a little bit easier. Even if you've uh, seen movies, I'm th- I think of like Saving Private Ryan or the, or the show Band of Brothers. They're going through suffering together. It's better to suffer with others. That's where, you, that's where you get your brothers in arms, your comrades, your teammates, people who stuck by you and took the pain alongside you. And the church can look like that, even if we're imperfect. When I worked out at Inspiration Point, uh, the Bible camp that, that we go to, a lot of the relationships were built on uh, mutual encouragement that the staff provided for one another. We're all there for the same goal. We want to spread the gospel and we work as a team toward that end. Counselors are, are the face of camp. Usually if you think about who works at camp, you think counselors. But surprise, there's actually more. There's more people uh, on staff that don't have just the title counselors. But everybody who's not a counselor gets put under this big umbrella, um, at least what's known at Inspiration Point, as the support staff. And they do what their name implies. The support staff has the people who are making food, who are cleaning toilets, floors, dishes, and tables. Right, Doug? Been there? Yep. Um, they set up activities for the counselors to show up at with their cabins and provide supervision, entertainment, and care when the counselors meet as a group a couple of times a day. And they take time every night to pray for the counselors and campers. They're known as the support staff because the counselors are the main people. They're the ones delivering the gospel. And the support staff does whatever they can to help give those counselors time to focus on spreading the gospel. And just, it's just usually behind the scenes. You don't see the support staff. The service corps and KP are like tucked back in a kitchen corner, usually potentially singing songs and having a grand old time by themselves, but they don't have nearly as much face-to-face time with the campers that go up. But the summers at camp uh, get long and sleep gets short. But I remember this one week, the staff stepped up their game as the week got harder. The support staff mainly 
the service corps who are in charge of cleaning everything, um, really focused hard on, on cleaning faster and, and doing extra. I think they maybe even just put like, instead of two people on a bathroom, they just put one person on a bathroom for this reason. They made cookies for the counselors. I was a counselor at the time. They made cookies and had them there ready for us at our, at our evening meeting. They went ahead and added extra work for themselves just to be a blessing to the other part of the staff. Some t- the next day, some counselors responded. Uh, the counselors do actually, they, they're supposed to get their cabins to clean up their rooms. Um, and there's the clean, clean cabin contest. And their goal was just to get all of that done before the cleaning cabin time so that during the cleaning cabin time, the counselor could go grab a mop and start on the bathrooms and start cleaning the bathrooms to help out then the support staff. Instead of escalating pranks, like I've heard from other camps, where you know, someone does something and someone does it even like more funny for some people or worse, uh, and it escalates that way, but I got to experience an escalation of, of trying to bless people. We understood uh, that, that work on the front lines was tough. And I got to be part of a team that for three months aimed to lift each other up in prayer. It didn't matter if the person you were serving was your best friend or not. And people were often treated like they were counted more significant than others. We leaned on each other for support. There are people within this church who are looking around to you for support and encouragement. And sometimes you guys might be the encourager, and sometimes you might be the one that's looking for encouragement. And there are certainly people outside of the church uh, that are looking to be cared for and offered hope. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing burdens. What's weighing on them, take part of that on yourself. And from, the, and from the Bible passage today, let each of you look not only to his own is, interests, but also to the interests of others. We can be united against the attacks of our opponents, but with a mindset like Christ's, we are also united against falling apart internally. And that's, when, when Paul's talking, he's like, don't be frightened by your opponents. That's no big deal. And then he goes into a, a lot of detail on how to remain united internally. Treat others, and, oh, instead of feeling like we deserve anything, look to treat others as more significant than ourselves, as better than we are. Treat others like they deserve to be treated well, even better than you would want others to treat you. We hear the golden rule, like treat others how you'd want them to treat them or how you'd want them to treat you. Jesus is like, treat other people better than you want to be treated. Forget about like, you know, what they might want or if, if I wouldn't mind if somebody punched me in the shoulder, so that means I can punch them in the shoulder. No, it's treating them better as if they're more significant than you. No one gets to be the best on, on this team of Christians. Jesus was perfect, and we're all bottom rung. We're all, you know, if Jesus is the varsity team, we're like the fifth graders who have never played the sport well or at all. We're all sinners. We're all at the bottom. The same exact price was paid for my sin as it was for yours. Jesus didn't die more for some people and less for others. They're like, oh, you're pretty good. I only need to a little bit die to save you. And you, oh no, you're real bad. I really have to die painfully for you. No, he died the same excruciating death for all of us, leveling that playing field. Our our sin all needed that same death from Jesus in order to be forgiven. So that's how, that's how we're uniform. That's where we're all at the same place, all needing a Savior. And we all need a Savior. So stop acting like you don't, like you, like you deserve extra, and we can all get to work as a team, as a whole. Promoting those around us and doing what we can to help others, being unified to each other through Christ. And he was the perfect example of this. Check your mindset against, against his. Because that's, that's what the second part of Philippians is, this, this passage 5 through 11, Christ's mindset. God 
is the only one who should be treated with the most significance. Yet Jesus chose to be humble. He was there before the beginning of time and everything that was made was made through him. Check out John 1.3. Everything that was made, made through Jesus. He put the planets in their place, named the stars, and yet it was he, Jesus, who washed those nasty, dirty feet of his disciples. It was Jesus who was humble enough to call Judas friend, even as he was in the process of betraying him. It was Jesus asking the Father to forgive people, the very people who were in the process of killing him on the cross, even though he was wrongly accused. You think that maybe there, on the cross, he would do something for himself first. But no, he, he died for us sinners, us enemies of God. So Jesus shows us what we should do. Die to ourself, our own selfish desires. Yet we usually don't, especially not perfectly, not even really pretty good. And that's sin, and sin deserves death. Jesus is God, but chose to be born a little baby human, weak and reliant on others to care for him. He never demanded for us to worship him. Jesus, Jesus never said, worship me. Even though he is and was perfect, but instead sought out ways to serve others instead. He didn't go out looking for apologies. He went out looking to forgive people. The process that, that I'm familiar with, um, I usually imagine like two seven-year-old boys, um, but two people, one waiting for the apology. They've been like rounded up and talked about, and then like one is made to apologize, and the other one's like waiting there, kind of feeling a little bit good about themselves because they're not the one who has to apologize. But when the apology finally begrudgingly comes, the other one usually says something like, that's okay. It's not okay. Um, it's every once in a while you might get a, uh, an I forgive you. Jesus was bringing that forgiveness before it was even asked of him. How well do you do that? How well do you forgive people even if they aren't apologizing? How often do you think to yourself that you actually need forgiveness? Or are we so proud to think that we don't even need to ask? The God of the universe modeled humility for us perfectly and we choose to ignore it and imagine ourselves as still good enough. We think of our lives being deserving. We look for others who will treat us with higher significance. We want to surround ourselves with people who look up to us, compliment us, worship us so we don't have to feel guilty and we, don't, and we, we can feel as if we deserve the position that we have. We can feel a little bit better than some other people. When you're on top, you don't, you don't owe those underneath you anything, right? Jesus doesn't owe us anything, anything. And yet he's ranked far, far above you and I, yet he gave everything. How do you measure up? Do you? No, I don't either. I'm not even close. I feel guilty about that. And right now, I hope you feel guilty about that too. That's, the, that's how the law works in us. The Holy Spirit pushing us to repentance. Hear this gospel now and, and be unified in Christ because he gives all we need. And he gave everything. He modeled humility perfectly. The God of the universe, Lord over all, was humble. And he sought us out to forgive us, to save us, not to condemn us, some of you guys know John 3.16, throw on the 17 on there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He was there before the beginning of time. The world was made through him, and he died because he loves you. You can compare your humility to Christ and realize that you're not. And you can also be incredibly grateful to Christ because of his humility and his love for you. The perfect sacrifice in Jesus was made to die, carrying the sin of the whole world. All sin placed on his shoulders, 
because he was the only one who could bear it. We can't. He bore it unto death, to conquer it, to put sin to death and bring life where death was deserved for me, for you. Therefore, in verse 9, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name above all names was Yahweh, as we best understand it. God the Father's own personal name. But now Jesus, taking part of Yahweh into Yeshua, God with us, is a name highly exalted. And that's the, that's the team that, I, that I'm on. The Jesus is Lord team. The God with us team. And he invites you. All will kneel before Jesus. Angels, demons, humans. And all will confess that he is Lord. Over all. He's exalted above all because he gave his all. Loving us immensely and equally by sacrificing his life for our sake. But unified in Jesus, he gives all we need. We can stand side by side, equal as sinners, as brothers in arms, knowing that our righteousness only comes for Christ. There's not one of us better on the sin spectrum than the others. And it's not much of a spectrum, it's sin or perfection. Faith in him and Jesus unites you with him and the whole body of believers. So again, from Philippians 2, starting 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That mind, yeah, it's, it's already yours through Christ. He gives all we need. Your neighbor, your neighbor is a sinner too. You both need Christ. And he's given it all. So I want you to go from here unified as a church, justified sinners, paid for by the blood of the God of the universe with a name above all names, Jesus. Let me pray. Awesome God. We don't, we don't measure up. Not that you needed to be told. You, you know, God, that we don't measure up. Help us to not get in our own way. Help us to have a mindset like that of Christ, being humble. He was humble to go from the very top to the, the embarrassing death, the mocking death of death on a cross for us. Help us be humble to, to be willing to ask for, for forgiveness, to repent of where we're wrong, um, come to you, because God, you're, you're faithful in your forgiveness of us. And that's so good, because as I fail, God, you, you were perfect. Help us to, to follow you and, re and remember that. Despite, despite our Severe lack of unrighteousness, God. Your righteousness um, can cover mine. And faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I think of that verse uh, pretty frequently. It helps that I once had it memorized, at least in the NIV and not in the ESV, as an eighth grader. Um, but I think about it when I part ways with people. 
when I say goodbye, I hope that, that they go standing firm in one spirit and mind, striving side by side for the gospel. And I hope that you guys go like that too, in the mindset of Christ. So WWJD, what would Jesus do? I don't know if that's what Jesus would do because it's his mindset, but that's something that he would have, he would have us do, to go in his mindset. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace. In the beautiful, wonderful, and powerful name of Jesus, the name above all names, go in God's peace. What a powerful name.